In this episode of Stage to Chat, I bring together Nadine Namal, an actor who has spent over four years in the Phantom of the Opera, most recently playing Raoul in Greece before their production was shut down in March. I also have Britt Lenting, who was part of the West End cast until their production closed soon after, and Sophia Ferguri, who is part of the cast of Prince of Egypt. We talk about their experiences during lockdown, how it's affected their mental health, and their thoughts on passive aggressive tweeting. And we also reflect on the explosion in Beirut and how Nadim hopes to raise money for the relief effort for a new staging of his musical, Broken Wings. Hello, gorgeous. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Oh, look at you all with the backdrop. And well, you know, it's going to be done. You're sticking it to your backdrop. <laughs> I take it everywhere. It just comes with me. It's like you roll it up, you stick it behind you wherever yeah. you go. I've seen people do that at Edinburgh Fringe. Somebody had like a background and two people carrying it around behind them. Brilliant. I mean, it's a choice. Yeah, exactly. Why not? I'm surprised you don't have it yet. Well, no, I gave them a day off. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> oh, just let me add Nadim. I've never met him, actually. Have you not? No. Oh, there we go. Hello. Good evening. Get Good yourself. evening. How are you? So this, right, is, this is Nadim. Brit Nadim. Hi, Nadim. Nice to meet you. You too. We've got so many mutual friends. I know, but we've—I was just saying that we've never met. Here is Zoom doing the job for us, right? <laughs> so funny. Sorry, I'm a bit dark, like in here. It's just like if I put the spotlights on on the ceiling, it looks really, really terrible. I don't worry about it. Hey, hello. How are we? Oh. Hello. I'm hello. sweating. Yes. Very warm. <laughs> So, hot. so warm. So how are you? I'm I'm right. drink. How are you? Oh, good. Is that a is that a pattern on your glass, or have you got like a mojito? Oh, it's, it's a pattern on my glass. It's definitely not a mojito. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so lovely to see all your faces. Oh, it's nice to see you. Nice to, I think I've met you briefly actually once before. So thank you all for joining me. So of course we've got Nadim the man, who's um, most recently been playing Ryle again, but over in Greece, in the Phantom of the yeah. Opera there. Oh. The beautiful Sophia, <laughs> who has worked together with Nadim before on your incredible show, Broken Wings. That's yeah. correct. But way back. Here is OG. She's yeah. right, right from the start. Yeah. God, and most recently for you, of course, you in the beautiful production of Prince of Egypt until yeah. Love, which we have been told is coming back from. They're taking bookings from the second of November. So. Yeah, we're hoping to be back before Christmas, but who knows? I mean. And then the gorgeous Brit Lenting, who was in at the time of lockdown, was in the Phantom of the Opera in the West End. Yay! <laughs> so let's start with that. So let's go right back. So when lockdown happened, how did you, were you first notified by the producers? And what did um, they say? Did they give you a time frame or? Well, it was all, it was just a bit of a weird thing, right? Because obviously, um, well, we were uh, told about a Greece happening, the Ooh. shutdown there. Then I got some friends in the Netherlands. They were, you know, shut down. And, and then, of course, New York happened. So we were all kind of feeling weird going into work, you know, and being like, are we going into work today? Uh, yes, we are. And then we're just kind of waiting for it to happen. And then that Monday, we were supposed to get our notes um, in the um, auditorium and um, that's when they told us um, you know guys you can go home pack your stuff we don't know when we're coming back so initially we just kind of thought oh it's going to be like I don't know three months maybe but no one anticipated this so it was it was weird. And was yeah. that the same for you Sophia right at the beginning? Yeah, it was it was a strange feeling of 
obviously you were seeing things happening in other countries and we were kind of had our warning, I guess. Um, but we went in on the Monday, having had Sunday off, did warm ups, fight calls, all of that. And then an hour before the show, just as we finished notes, the producer came on stage and was very upset to tell us, I'm sorry, we can't do the show tonight. And it was a real mixture of emotions actually amongst the company because everyone was there, crew, cast, you know, front of house. And there was just a real, I think a, a lot of us were quite kind of like, what, it, this is so, this has never happened. You know, it's like, how do you deal with it? You know, it's just a very strange feeling of leaving the theater, not knowing when you're going back. But like Brit said, we, I didn't think it would be this long. You know, I guess none of us knew this quite how huge this was until we were in the depths of lockdown. And you're like, oh my goodness, this is, we're not going back anytime soon. Yeah. And for you, Nadim, so you were obviously in Greece. How long had you been out there by then? Um, so we went to Greece in November and we rehearsed for a month in Athens. Um, and then came home for Christmas. We had two weeks off for Christmas. And then when we went back, we went back to Greece beginning of Jan and it was, we went to Thessaloniki first. And at that time, coronavirus became this news story and we were in a hotel and the only English channel on TV in the hotel was BBC News. So like six times a day or whatever it was, I'd see these, these bulletins of this thing coming over from the Far East over closer and closer and closer. So we like, like, Sphere and Brit have already said it was that sense of waiting um but what happened in Greece was was really quite different to what happened here like in Greece they they shut it down so early right. um I, th I think only three people had died at the time and they had they just decided as a country that they don't have the economy or the infrastructure to try and fight this thing or live alongside it so they just made a decision very early on to just shut down close everything and as a result, they were back out on the streets six weeks later with only 200 deaths in total. And, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but it does seem that countries like Greece and New Zealand and, and places that adopted that approach are back to normal now pretty much um, compared to the rest of us. So we, so we got our notice um, an hour before we were about to get on the bus to go to the theatre. Our phones just all pinged and we had an email from the producer saying, I'm really sorry, anywhere that has over a thousand capacity is shutting down effective immediately so we have to cancel the rest of the run um but we were in greece and we couldn't get flights home for like four days we just had to stay in greece and really draw out the farewells and drink lots of wine maybe <laughs> <laughs> we, we just made the best of it but it was really weird and sad because we we would we were doing that whilst everyone else was still going to work like you know friends in London were still going to work and we thought oh they've done this too soon it's been a bit bit you know early a bit a bit reactionary but turns out they nailed it so and how, long were you supposed to, how long were you due to carry on out there for we had we only had another month to go but um you know it was it was a three-month run so for the producers they had done the whole budget based on selling three months of shows so they're very much still hoping that it carries on and they can finish their run at some point. The set is still there. The costumes are still there. Okay. Um, it would be it would be in their interest to finish it off. We got availability checks for September onwards, and obviously we were all like, "I'm free." <laughs> so, so uh, hopefully at some point we'll get to go back and, and finish what we started, which would be lovely. The pictures looked amazing. They did. They absolutely did. Yeah, they did. That's beautiful. The yeah. beautiful. Production. And it's really special because, you know, obviously with what's happened in London recently and there was all that, you know, unnecessary debate about whether it was going to be the brilliant original coming back or, or a new production or whatever. And thankfully it is a brilliant original that's going to come back. But there is a lot to be said for the fact that Phantom is such a good show that it, the story and the score are what make it what it is. And we did it on a new set and it, and it, it, was, it wasn't better. It wasn't worse. It was just different, and it was just beautiful to to take something so familiar and redesign it and and reblock it and uh, feel like you were part of something sort of really familiar but also uh, original as well. That was really nice. So if this, you know if this is shows do come back in new productions, then it doesn't always have to be the cause of such yeah. drama yeah. as it might, might initially.
Well, I mean, we did see this with Les Mis, where they they did adapt it and modify and bring it back in. Yeah. Nobody really. I mean, there's obviously speculation about what is going to happen with regards to Phantom. Britt, can you shed any light on this? I mean, bring us up to speed. Well, all the plants right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, how? Not the plenty one, but I'm very busy with redesigning. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I know as much as you do, you know, like, I, I think what is safe to say, what we do know, it's coming back. And that's all I can say, because the rest is just like, nothing is clear. Like, you know, they, they had to sadly let go of everyone. Who is coming back? No one knows. Is Fentel coming back? Yes. In what shape and form? I don't know. And I saw the pictures of you clearing out your dressing room, so, uh, I mean... Talk us through that. How was that for you? I mean, this was a dream job for you, right? Oh yeah, it was a dream job. I um, I moved. Obviously, I moved here four years ago with like nothing but a dream. So for me to, you know, be able to actually make that dream come true and then start it last year September, in such an amazing production in that part was just magic, and. Well, you know, I've had the best time, you know, and I, I, I can say I, I don't feel I'm ready to say bye yet. Luckily, I'm a young Carlotta. So, you know, I feel like I'll play her again at some point. Um, but God, yes, uh, I mean, my dressing room, I, I was getting very comfortable in my dressing room. So I had yeah. lots of stuff in there. <laughs> and um, I needed to clear all of that out. Um, so Is that your chair? The chair you're sat on? It's actually in my dressing room chair. <laughs> Yeah, I'm now sitting in my living room. There's literally no space there for, so it's a weird corner where I'm sitting now, but it's okay. Um, yeah, it was weird because you know what? Everyone has left the building and I really wanted to go and look in the auditorium or like see the stage, but we were absolutely not allowed. Right. Um, so it was very, it felt a bit like the soul had left the building because yeah. it was just empty everywhere. Do you know what I mean? So... And then obviously I had to clean my dressing room and well, I was locked. And when were you given that news? Because obviously recently there's been the likes of the Book of Mormon and Dear Evan Hansen and the uproar about how the casting crews found out about their closures or pauses. Um, how, how did the producers approach you with this information? Um, we were told in a group Zoom meeting, something like this, but then with 115 people. So wow. it was very weird. Wow. But at least they took a moment to tell us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And was that far in advance of it being made public? Um, we knew mid June. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a it's a it was a weird day you know you know at one point you hear that you are not sure if you can come back obviously i'm still very hopeful um but officially i have nothing to look forward to um and in the same day the release came from that the shows are coming back you know phantom the other shows uh let me mary poppins hamilton and phantom are coming back and in the morning we were let go and i was just thinking yeah that's great and i'm really excited the show is coming back but like I don't know if it's going to be with me. And I suppose for me personally, that has always been my light at the end of the tunnel during these challenging times. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Sophia, Sophia. talk to us about the Dominion. Is, is your stuff still there? How's it? Yeah, so I, I've only been to London once since March, whenever it was, March 16th. And that was to go to the theatre about three weeks ago. Um, they opened the theatre for us to get, get anything we wanted from our dressing rooms. And it was a really, I mean, just being in London anyway was a very strange experience. I guess, you know, it's the longest period of time I've not been in London for as long as I can remember, but also just kind of coming back and, you know, going along the stomping ground roads that I'd normally go down every day and going, my life is so different right now. It's not the same as when I was last here. Um, but going into the theatre and our dressing rooms, it was like, an apocalypse like everything was exactly apart from the fridges being emptied <laughs> and any perishables being thrown away everything was left exactly the same and that was a really strange experience kind of going in and going it's like time has just stopped and you know really odd like a very strange it was a weird day it was a weird day not seeing people and the dressing room not having people in but everything being there if that makes sense 
And with your show, like, how long do they anticipate you would need to be rehearsed to get back on that stage? Have they indicated? We'll have to tech the show. It's a very technical show. Yeah. And a lot, I mean, you've seen it, haven't you? Yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. a lot, you know, it's technically difficult in terms of just with, well, cast and crew, really. There's so much going on at any one point. So they've said at least two weeks. They've kind of mapped out, I think, about two weeks to tech it. But I guess it depends on how long we're away for as well, because it could be a year. <laughs> It'll be like, gosh, <laughs> start all over again, you know. It's just, but I think two, two weeks is kind of the rough sort of time that they've allowed for us to get back on our feet. And that it's, our, it's our responsibility to know what we do, you know. But scary. <laughs> And for you, Brits, so you were one of the to, to recently people have been Brits have been flying out to most recently South Korea for the production of Cats, um, and you were lucky enough to fly out to Portugal for one of their very first socially distanced concerts. That was that was a gift, you know. Like honestly, it was so amazing. Um, it is possible, you know. Obviously, I do respect that UK has different numbers than Portugal at the time, um, but it was really amazing to see everyone working together. So it's not a gig with four people, you know. It was with a full orchestra, a choir, um, you know. So it was a lot of people involved, and everyone was really um, doing what they should be doing. So keeping the distance, wearing their masks. Obviously, when I was singing, I wasn't wearing my mask but yeah it was it was very special and when I for the first time heard this amazing orchestra play I cried you know it was in this beautiful hall the music the musicians were amazing and there was all of these amazing sing songs excuse me I'm, I'm not English songs we were supposed to do uh, <laughs> well then I got to sing and I was just so happy you know I was just happy yeah and then and at the end of you know the first time when we got on stage and the audience it was like about I would say 50% maybe I don't know exactly to see them I literally messed up some of the words of the first song because I was just like, oh, I'm like a little puppy, you know, I'd be like, yay, there's people there. I'm so happy, you know, I'm singing. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. But did you have any worries about going to a foreign country at the height of the pandemic still? Uh, no, because I knew where I was going and the numbers are better there than here. The only thing that I was worried about potentially would be the flight. Um, just because you're so on, you know, in a, in a confined space, let's say. But um, the flight was really not full, and I didn't feel worried. And I was just wearing a good mask. And it's not eight hours; it's only like three, so or two maybe even. So I didn't feel worried or like, uh, you know, you just have to be aware and wash your hands and all that stuff. You know? How do you feel, Nadine? So obviously. You said there's a possibility that you might be invited back to Greece to complete. Yeah. Are, are you optimistic about that? How do you feel about? Yeah. Literally, honestly, I I make no, uh, I've got no um, problem with saying at all that I would glad I'd go anywhere right now. Um, I think that as much as I love the UK, I think that they've handled the situation terribly compared to other countries. And you know what Brit's saying about flights is spot on. I mean. There's a bit of an urban myth about being on planes being dangerous, but actually the air filtration on a plane is the same as they have in a hospital surgery. Yeah. Um, 99.9% .9 of bacteria gets filtered out as you breathe it, and there's a thing above everybody's seat. So 
it's safe to get on a plane and that's why you can get on a plane three abreast and not go to a theatre because it is a full of dirty, dusty air. Um, so I would go to Greece in a heartbeat. I'd go anywhere. Um, I'd, go, I'd go and sing or be in a show in any country right now um, as long as all the standard precautions are in place. And I think what Andrew Lloyd Webber is trying to do with replicating the South Korean model with um, the sp- uh, disinfectant spray as you arrive at the theater and the temperature checks and the masks, this stuff he's tried with the Palladium, it works, but it will only work if the government allow enough bodies in the yeah. um, to pay to pay for the show. So I think that, um, I think what Brit did in Portugal is the way forward for now. Like, I think there's been too much focus here in London about just getting the West End shows reopened. Um, Obviously, that's the goal. But while they're not able to open, there's nothing to stop people doing concerts that feature smaller casts and socially distanced. Just like put, put other things on the stages. Maybe do maybe do a reading of a new play. Maybe do a concert version of a, of a well-known musical. Like we don't necessarily have to just wait until all the West End shows can reopen. We can do other things in the meantime that I think would bring a lot of positivity and give people jobs and and a paycheck and you know, get everyone buzzing about a, a, a trip into London again, maybe. It happens nicely up to a certain musical that you wrote that you're looking into trying to get. How is that going? So you put an appeal out last week. We'll talk about why you want to bring this back. Um, but I just want to know, so did you put an appeal out to any theatres that might be able to host it? Have you had yeah. any look with that yet? Yes, we have. So basically what's happening is there's two, there's two things going on at the same time. Um, Broken Wings has been traveling around um, the Middle East for the last 18 months. Uh, and we were in Dubai in January and we had an amazing week at the Dubai Opera House, which is a stunning venue. And it went really well. It was full and the momentum was sky high. And then just as we started talking to other, other cities, we were, we were this close to going to Paris in November, it all happened, COVID happened and everything just got panned. Um, so we've had that on the back burner. Fortunately now, the Middle Eastern theatres are operating at 50% capacity plus and loads of them are outdoor. So they've started to pick up the phone again and be like, okay, could we make this happen You know, in the next six to nine months? Can you bring a version of the show that's slightly more socially distanced? Can it be slightly smaller? Because the budgets have all been cut by 20, 30%. So, so we will need to take this show out with a smaller cast, a smaller orchestra. But I think that that's better than the story not being told at all. So we're focusing on that on the one hand. And on the other side, we are trying to do something to raise funds for Lebanon after what's happened in Beirut this week. And that's what's the appeal on Twitter was for. I'm looking for somewhere to record some live performances from the show that we can incorporate with some live performances from Lebanon. Right. I hope to make a very nice fundraising video tribute to what's happened. Um, so watch this space. That's the plan. Yeah, so let's talk about Beirut and obviously the, the tragic images that we all saw especially for for both of you so you and Sophia were, were there this time last year before literally yeah yeah <laughs> there's a dream that spawn out of a well that your toil has helped to sow there's a love that grows from laughter, from the truth that sorrow holds. There's a flame that flickers left and right from the day that you were born. There's a home that's made up of the places we were meant to roam. Like the spirit of the sun, it's calling out to me, rising through the tallest towers of my soul. So 
so what's it like for you both? Firstly, were you both no friends and family out there and they're all safe? Everybody's safe, just yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, so I, so I, my dad's Lebanese and more than half of my relatives live in Beirut still and have done for years. And so I go there two or three times a year. It's the most beautiful, charming, fun, welcoming, melting pot of a city. And I'm so proud whenever I go there of my heritage. And I love taking people there who've never been there before because they're always so surprised at how cool it is. Um, but it's got a lot of political complications because it's from a part of the world where you've got 12 religions coexisting side by side. And that's at the heart of everything. Um, and as someone who's not religious personally, I find that deeply sad and frustrating, but I get it. Um, the Middle East you know, is the birthplace of all these things. Um, but what's been really sad on this occasion is that Lebanon has just had one of the hardest years in its history. Um, the banking system has completely collapsed. There's been a financial crash and then COVID happened. So basically their, their skint and their morale is rock bottom. And then this happened, this explosion happened this week. So it just feels like it's kick after kick after kick. Um, but Lebanon has a history of rebuilding itself very quickly. Beirut in particular has a never say die attitude. So I think honestly, like it, it, it looks like a war zone on TV right now, but in like two years, that whole area will be redeveloped and people will be saying, go to Lebanon on a holiday again, because that's just, that's the history of it. That's just cyclically happened over and over again. I mean, on top of, so obviously, I think the latest figures is 137 are dead, 5,000 mm. injured. But there's almost 300,000 that are temporarily homeless. Yeah. So that's huge. I mean, it's a what population of 2 million? Is yeah, there? the city, Beirut has a population of 2 million. I mean, the country as a whole is only 4 million. Um, yeah. 1 million of those are Syrian refugees. So there's only three, three million Lebanese people in Lebanon, basically. Um, and they're all packed into this tiny little coastal city, where it, which is the heart of the country. Um, the thing that's extraordinary is that only 150 people have died. I mean, like, honestly, like when you see that footage and you, and you watch the scale of it, it's, it's mind blowing that that few people have, have lost their lives. I mean, I can only assume it's because it was in the evening on a weekday and during a pandemic. But that area is very commercial. and. It, Maybe a lot of people want to work and that's a blessing in disguise. Um, but what's happening, what's going to happen now, I think, is that there's plenty of aid on its way. But they want, these countries that are going to support Lebanon want Lebanon to sort out its political system first and find a fairer and more progressive government who will handle the aid and, and rebuild the city responsibly rather than giving it to the same people who got us in this mess in the first place. So I think it will be interesting to see what happens over the next few months. For sure. And in the meantime, if people want to help, Sophia, your friend Yasmin Audi has set up a fund, hasn't she? Well, Yasmin was in um, Broken Wings with her. So she's got family. She's got, still got family that, that live in Beirut, hasn't she? Uh, but she's, she's done ama an amazing thing. She just got on it straight away. I think it was that evening. She set up the Beirut Relief Fund, uh, which is to raise funds for the Lebanese Red Cross. Um, and yeah, I, 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 this, maybe it's uh, obviously when you know people that have family there, that obviously hits a, you know, it just feels so much more because you know how much that's affecting your friends, you know, but and obviously we were there. We were pretty much in that area, weren't we, Nadim? Like, it seems like it was on the... We, By the port. Were, we had dinner about 100 metres from, from the port, yeah, on our last oh. night. Um, it's very, yeah, it's very, very sad and very, very real. It was very real. I mean, my, my, um, my, cousin's, my cousin's office was 300 metres away from the blast site. And he left in his car four minutes before the bomb went off. So, like, is that, that that kind of fine margin thing that when you think about it for too long just really freaks you out? Um, but thankfully, he thankfully he was you know a kilometre away in his car and just got hit by a bit of debris on the top of his car. Yeah. I mean, obviously they're, they're looking into it all and they're investigated, but it is suspected that it was a stash of 
ammonium nitrate that had been left there since 2013. And apparently part of the problem was that it, it over time it oxidizes and that caused the problem, um, which is tragic. But I mean, how, what were your responses when you immediately saw those images? Because I remember seeing it and I think I'd happened to have seen earlier that morning a report about Hiroshima and the 75 year anniversary. Yeah these images of a mushroom clown and I made I jumped to the wrong assumption and assumed that somebody had deployed something were you did you feel the same was that your initial reactions what did you think I thought I, I think... thought it was a bomb that's what it's just it looked like a film didn't it it's yeah. like it didn't look real <laughs> just real. Oh, yeah. I think that my so my my thoughts on it are that the the fact that that ammonium nitrate was in that port in the first place is the cause of what's happened. Um, and that is down to the negligence and corruption of a government that I think wanted that stuff to be brought into the country for whatever reason, but didn't know where to put it. So just left it there under lock and key. Um, I, I don't think it was necessarily a deliberate explosion because I think if someone wanted to deliberately put off a device in Beirut, they wouldn't do it on the corner of the port where three quarters of the glass went out into the sea yeah. and only a small portion of it went into the city. Like, thank heavens that's what happened. But if you, if you, if you really wanted to drop a missile or drop something on, on Beirut to cause as much destruction as possible, they could have done it anywhere where it would have caused 10 times more damage. Um, and also, there's been this thing I found out today that there's been this number going around about it being 2,700 tonnes ammonium nitrate apparently someone in france has figured out that if that was the amount the entire country would be a crater um so it's actually more like two or three hundred tons that went off but the sad, sad and scary part about that is there are records of 2700 tons coming into the country so that means the rest of it is somewhere else and nobody knows where it is wow so yeah mm -hmm. good news at the same time <laughs> and tell me, the, so, since you're both here, tell me a little bit about, I mean, I saw Broken Wings when it was in, when you did your West End run, um, but how would you describe it? I mean, you, you guys know it inside out. How would, tell Brit what it was about. Yeah, it's, I have no idea except for a Google, but... <laughs> you did. Go on, Nads. <laughs> it's less like embarrassing than me doing I mean, it. Is my... this, this is a novel that was over a hundred years old that you've you've adapted into a musical. So I mean, was that a, was there a pressure or a kind of responsibility with that? Okay, so what happened was the guy who wrote this book, uh, Khalil Gibran, is the he's the the. Shakespeare of the Middle East. He's like the most famous artistic influence from the region. Uh, and he's the kind of guy who has, he's written all these beautiful poems and they are read at weddings and funerals and graduation ceremonies. And Lebanese people have him all over the walls of their house. And um, you hear about him as a kid from your grandparents and he's just a permanent presence. So I've always been aware of him growing up and read this book, Broken Wings, which is a really short book. You can read it in like two or three hours. So straight away I was like, oh, it's the same thing, the musical, that's interesting. Um, and it's basically like a diary about when he was 18 years old. He fell in love with a girl, um, but he couldn't be with her because of um, the customs of society. He couldn't be with her because she was in an arranged marriage. And it's an arranged marriage that was extremely damaging to both people who were in it. So it's a very sad story and it doesn't work out. But basically it, it puts a magnifying glass on many things that still happen in the Middle East and Asia and Africa and many parts of the world 112 years later. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's like you're, you're, you're reading someone who's, who's a feminist, he is anti-religion, he is 
uh, total humanitarian. And this is a Middle Eastern man 112 years ago. And he's basically saying, guys, we've got this all wrong. Like, everything we're doing is damaging people. So it's, so it's a very powerful novel. And nobody had put Gibran on stage in a musical. So it seemed like a bit of a no brainer. And thankfully, the show went well, really well. And people in the Middle East in particular welcomed us and wanted to have this. So we've been able to do it in London, but then travel to some really exotic and warm locations and work, collaborate with local crew, local musicians, and, and, and give something back, I suppose, like take the West End format and take it to part of the world that isn't quite so used to doing that. Um, they have lots of shows go there, but they're normally tours. They don't do many of their own shows. So to have a, a Lebanese story in the Middle East with Arabic musicians um, felt like a really special thing to do. It was really incredible as well, even when we did it back in London two years ago, to see who was in the audience. Because they were people, we were telling, it was their story. So actually, even back in the Haymarket, you know, you had women in hijabs and, they, you know, they were very visibly, like, moved by what they were seeing because it, it's their story you know and issues that they live with um and I think that was something that you know it felt like we were bringing in people into the theatre that wouldn't necessarily like you know like, go and see something I don't know I just or it was yeah. just it just felt like it was something much more personal for them anyway where everywhere we've done it actually in it's you know, when we went to Doha as well, it was, you know, a lot of the time it's kind of sit and be entertained, whereas the audience were just, you could see them feeling it. It was a lot more, they were a lot more expressive than I imagined them to be, I think. Like, you know, because it's just like, it's not, it's not usual for them. It's not a common thing for them to have that but, kind um, of story be played out. And it felt quite controversial as well, it, it, you know, in some ways. That, that was a bit of a thing we were a bit nervous about, wasn't it? But the, the reception was wonderful. I was going to say, it's a part of the world that isn't used to um, public critique of how society works there. So we were doing this feminist story in an auditorium where the men sit on the front row and the women sit behind. Uh, that's just in, Gulf, right? And it's totally normal to them. And, 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 you know, we were then stood on stage singing lyrics and saying lines about how men treat women accordingly. And the women were like standing up and whooping and <laughs> clapping in the middle of speeches. And it was amazing. That, that was amazing. And that's, that's something that you would never get in, in London. You know, you, you, can, you can tell a Middle Eastern story in London, or you can tell a story from any part of the world in London or New York, but you won't touch people's hearts in the same way as if you take it to the, the place where the heritage matters the most. Um, so it's been really interesting developing a show here and then taking it to um, audiences who I suppose can live and breathe it in a slightly more authentic way. Yeah. And for you, have you missed performing? I mean, obviously Brit's been lucky enough to get back into it, but how are and you both? One night, one night, but it was amazing. <laughs> One night only. <laughs> and then I was supposed to the team, you've been doing a lot of online stuff. So I, I caught you in a, a Night at Joe's. I'm nervous and upset because this girl I've never met I get to meet tonight at eight. I'm taking her to dinner at a charming old cafe but who can eat tonight at eight? You popped up in there. Yeah. And then you had a Leave a Light on concert. Yeah, I mean, listen, the online stuff has been has been great. And it, it especially in the first month or two, it was a total lifesaver, I think, for a lot of people, um, because it was like we were carrying on the momentum of what we were doing previously. But I think that as time's passed, I think it's right that the online things kind of calmed down a little bit because I think it got to a point where it was like, hang on, we're all just like giving away what we do for free 
constantly. And other people in their professions are not doing that. And, you know, we were, we were fighting really hard as an industry to be heard by the government and to, to be given grants and help and support. But at the same time, we were like, here's a concert, here's a concert, here's this thing I'm doing. And it's all for free, 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 free. So if you, if you get the public used to giving them stuff for free, why are they going to, why are they going to want to pay for it in the future? I think it's really important that we as an industry value what we do enough that if someone wants to watch us do a concert online, the least they can do is pay a fiver. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think it's good that we've gone more in that direction and, and producers, there've been some amazing producers like um, Lambert Jackson, yeah. you know, this very simple concepts, do songs for a new world for people, but buy a ticket, people gladly buy a ticket and it feels like a more special occasion. So I think it's, it's really good that, that it's gone down that road. Um, and I've, I've missed performing massively because singing to your laptop or your phone is just not the same. It, 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 fills a, it, fills a, it fills a gap for a couple of weeks, but then after a while, you know, as Brit would have found in, in Portugal, even if there are only 40 people in that room, it would feel better than singing to 10,000 people via your phone, I think. Personally. <laughs> and you mentioned um, Lambert Jackson then, because you championed them recently. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about this as well. Um, the passive aggression that you highlighted yeah. and stuck yeah. up for. Um, yeah, how do you feel about that? I feel like, <clears throat> I feel like theatre the theatre industry, and I'm, I'm, I've said this for years, it's not anything new, but I feel like the theatre industry is excellent at uniting when it's attacked from the outside. When someone, as someone who's not in theatre passes a comment about how we're not a serious profession or how we don't need funding or we should just be shut down or whatever, everyone rallies together in the most amazing way. But theatre is also exceptionally talented at being catty and aggressive within and I would always say that that's probably first and foremost out of jealousy or bitterness. And I get that people are scared. I get that people are feeling they're, they're missing out. I get that people are feeling af afraid of where their careers are going. And in many cases, people's careers haven't even started yet. You know, they've just graduated and they've, they've, they don't know what's happening. But the one thing you can't do is go on social media and publicly slag off people who are creating work for other people. Um, I find it so immature and irresponsible. And also just way wider the mark because the reality of our business is it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter which company you work for, every producer has their favorites, every casting director has their favorites, every director has their favorites. Yeah. And whatever team you're building for a show will always be a balance of, I need a few people that I know really well and trust, I need a few people who've got a good CV, who I don't know, but look at their CV. And then let's give some new people some opportunities, some graduates and some people from overseas and some people who we've not met before. And every company in the West End is built like that and always has been because you can't, you, you can't, you can't expect it to, to be any other way. Um, so this idea that, that it's a new thing, that some people get more work than others is just a total red herring. Um, and yes, obviously, it goes without saying that you want new people to get opportunities. You know, when I cast Broken Wings, I gave loads of new people opportunities. I gave loads of graduates jobs. I've given graduates lead roles because that's what I believe in. But I also picked two or three people to be lead roles who I knew I could trust with that, with that part. And I think as long as the balance between those two things is, is there, then, then you're not really doing anything... And here's another thing, sorry, just to finish. Can you tell that I feel passionate about this one? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this for my own gain. Like, I've not produced anything during lockdown. Um, I just feel really sorry for the producers who are busting the guts to give people a job during this time and are getting grief for it because some people are a myth that they're not, in, not a part of it. And it's just, it, it's the saddest thing to see people do that publicly on social media. Um, I, I think it, I think it's this polar opposite of what we need as a business. You know what I mean? And it's exactly that. It's the fact that, especially during lockdown, where we're in uncharted territory. Like we're doing things at uh, a different pace, 
that people yeah. are very experimental in what we're, we're trying to put together and people are naturally going to gravitate towards people that they, they know how they work, they know how they operate, they know they can trust, they know they can rely on. So it's, it's understandable. From, and it, like I say, it's not new. It's something that the industry has been built on for years. Yeah. And it's also, it's, it's particularly interesting as well, because I think it's the thing that we're all guilty of in the business, that we feel like we're missing out, right? And normally when we're unemployed, it feels like everyone else is booking jobs and getting nominated for awards, but this is the first time that we've all been in the same boat and we've all been unemployed at the same time. Um, so I think it's been really interesting getting that psychology, um, getting used to that psychology. But the one thing I, I can say with some certainty is that if you are a producer and you are doing things like Lambert Jackson or you're doing um, Barn Theatre in Siren Sester, have been amazing. We've done their Shakespeare project and they've given like 150 actors the opportunity to do a monologue, 30% of whom have been graduated. Yeah. But it feels like people don't pay attention to those kinds of stories. They just really ham up the negative ones. Um, and then you can, and, and every day I see things like looking for, looking for six actors for this, looking for people to send tapes for this short film I'm making. And there's, there's this stuff going on all the time, but if it's not like high profile, people don't tend to respond to it in the same way. And at the end of the day, if you are wanting to be booked for something, it's really not a very good idea to go on Twitter and slag off the producer of something. I can promise you. I never you, understand it. I never understand it. You are only less likely to get a job ever again than you were before. So please people stop doing it. Stop going on and being catty every <laughs> And it's that question and say, well, yes, we, we understand that you're upset and you're venting, but have you spoken to your agent? Have you spoken to the producer? Have you sent those emails first before taking it yeah. to Twitter? But also, I'm sorry, just to say, like, obviously, I, I totally understand what you said, especially as I came to London new and I didn't know anyone. I noticed, like, oh, how do I get in, like, to get in that circle? But I, you know, you have to think, first of all, it's really positive that things are happening. It doesn't matter who produces it, it doesn't matter who is doing it, because it's representing us, do you know what I mean? And sometimes it's just about that. And then equally, I always believe everyone has their journey. So if, I don't know, let's say person X has a job, I'm happy for that person, because that's their journey, you know what I mean? And I feel you should, you should... I don't understand people. Of course, I would like to be person X at that moment, but I'm also thinking, well, she is it now, you know, and everyone has their time and moments. I don't understand that slacking off at all. Yeah, it's so true. And, and the irony of all of this, of course, is that thousands of us, myself included, have been unemployed for twice as long as this period. Yeah. In the past. <laughs> Literally, like... I've been unemployed for like 18 months at a time before and in that period you go and get other jobs and you, or you become a teacher or you do um, whatever, you, you do it and at that time only you're unemployed for 18 months but everyone around you is getting finals and recalls and booking jobs and getting invited to the Olivier's and the Watson Stage Awards because they're, they're in a new show and you're a year, a year since your last job and, and that's much harder than what's happening now, so much harder. Um, on a personal level, obviously what's happening to the industry now is worse, but you know, people, people need to, I think, just remember that we're, that we're all in it together. And yes, some people might have been asked to do three or four concerts online whilst others might have been asked to do one or two, but in the grand scheme of things with 65,000 people dying and the world on its head, like the last thing we should be doing is going on Twitter and hanging out those people to dry who are giving the few opportunities, um, that, that they are. I think it's just really, basically. Yeah. And keeping within that, so talking about being productive and Sophia, you've started your own cottage industry, haven't you? Tell us about Ava and Azar. <laughs> this is incredible, because this is exactly what the Dean was saying there about people. We've all been in this situation where we're, we're out of luck. And, Rather than complain about it, it's about being proactive and finding other things that we could do. And you've done it. So tell us about I mean, it. Listen, it's, I mean, I've spent, what, four months of lockdown just kind of going through the day, going, just get through the day. Because I think for me, well, my, for me personally, I was living in London, renting room, living with a castmate. 
and you know we were just in this exhausting bubble for about three and a half months of rehearsing the show and we never really settled with the show before it closed and then you know the day after the show shut I came back to my flat here in Colchester and I've just spent this entire time on my own <laughs> which you know it was just such a start it was such a contrast to what I'd been living you know it was um took a long time for me to get used to, but I'm not going to sit here and go, it's not affected my mental health. You know, I think everyone's been affected in one way or another. And I found I've had some really hard days. I'm, you know, be lying if I said I've been fine. You know, it's, it's been like a lot of friends and family, you know, you have your good days and your bad days. And it kind of came from a day, I guess, of despair of just going, what can I do I feel like I need a sense of purpose or something just to you know keep me busy as well because I like being busy (laughs) Um, and I was speaking with a friend and you know just she just said well is there something creative that you'd like to do like is there something that that you could make you know and I just said well I'd quite like to do maybe make some jewelry (laughs) and then straight away she was like your earrings you're known for wearing big earrings you love earrings that's what everyone knows you for I was like I do (laughs) I do like earrings (laughs) and it was really just came off on a whim it was something that just happened and then the that day I thought I'll go and buy some clay (laughs) and the rest is history like I've just loved it you know it's um, beautiful so you've got an Instagram page that I was having a look at and they're stunning and they're all they go back to your Persian heritage don't they well I wanted to base it around you know the same I've, I've been to Iran a lot as a child and you know, I've, uh, I don't really have much connection to that side of my heritage anymore. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I, I, w- I want to go back to Iran, but again, because of its political status, it's quite a different, and especially now, you can't, you can't go there. But, it, you know, I have vivid memories of this, the beauty of that country. And um, I guess I just wanted to, you know, I love all the blues. That's like my favourite kind of colour palette and you know just getting inspired by looking at images of places I've been to and places I haven't actually uh, in Iran and just using that as my inspiration and trying to kind of make a connection to my heritage and you know it's I love it like honestly it's been so therapeutic for me and the the kind of positive comments and support I've had has been I didn't think it would become this it's just been wonderful I love it I feel like I'm going through my day I wake up early and like right you've got earrings to make you know and it's just been something that's come out of a time I just never thought it would you know it's funny isn't it what lockdown can do some positives can come out of it (laughs) and for you Nadine one of your ways of kind of keeping your days busy and getting you your mental health back on track has been you running hasn't it yeah it has it, it running i mean yeah like i completely echo what sophia said about the mental health side of things like it's been really really tough um the last few months and i i was in greece alone for three months before this and then sort of came back from that to being with my family 24 7 i've got two daughters who are four and two uh who obviously weren't at nursery so it's been a really difficult period um for lots of reasons but I found two, two things that have helped me through it are running. Running, I've always loved running, but in particular now, because it's the first time I've done it without being in a show as well. Um, so I can actually follow a training plan, have reason to get out the door early in the morning, eat healthy, cook healthy. Uh, and yeah, so although my mental health might have suffered during lockdown, my physical health is as big as it's been for like 10 years. So that's great. Um, but the other thing is, is been writing. Um, I've had time at the piano that I'd never dream of normally um, and I'm halfway through my next show which is exciting. Um, is there um, a written Sophia in it? There might be. <laughs> <laughs> if she sends me some free earrings obviously. <laughs> on your, your running again so you you're actually training for the marathon and you've said that even if it doesn't go ahead on the 2nd of october you will still run a marathon that day yeah that's right i support have you mapped out a route yet have you decided how you're going to do it yeah so so that um has now actually been taken out of my hands and the marathon was cancelled two days ago uh which is a shame but 
they are offering us the ability to defer our place for the next three years whenever we want to do it. So that's cool. But also they've set up this um, online thing where we can basically download an app and press start and run our, run our marathon. And the, the time we do it in will count towards future qualification for events. And we get sent a medal and we get a t-shirt and all that sort of stuff. So it, it, it doesn't quite feel like it would just be me on my own doing it anymore, which is nice. Um, but I will go, yeah, I'll probably head to Greenwich um, where the marathon would have started and then do some kind of run back across London um, in, in the sort of safe, as safe a way as possible, just to sort of make it a special occasion because all my training has been... I don't you've, want to... you've already raised over £2,300, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been great. I'm very lucky that people have got behind it. I think because it's NSPCC, I think it's, um, it's a charity that people just don't need much... They don't need much to sort of understand why it's important, you know, um, especially in lockdown. You think about how adults have felt living with one another in lockdown. And then you think about vulnerable kids who have abusive parents and kids who have been deprived of school and positive role models. And it, it, yeah, it's frightening. So I think that people have bought into the idea of it quite nicely. And, and the good thing about all this fundraising is if you donate something, the NSPCC have the money within a week. Like it's not, it's uh. not dependent dependent on me doing the run I'm going to do the run obviously but um the technology is such that the money makes a difference straight away so I think that's quite appealing as well um and you said, like, I, I mean I know it's very cliche that every penny counts but you said as well with your a go for me page is this kind of tendency that people see large mouths and it puts them off putting yeah. a smaller amount in but that, yeah. it makes it like every penny, even if you could only put 50p in or a pound, it makes a difference, right? It's, so you're, you're spot on. And it's, it's, it's one of the real problems with online f fundraising and crowdfunders and things. You know, people feel like, oh, I can't give much, therefore I won't bother at all. But those same people would then go to a bake sale or um, a charity shop and spend like three quid on something and not think anything of it. But that three quid, like that pays for with NSPCC three pounds will pay for um you know a child line um volunteer calling uh, having having an hour-long conversation with a child who's a victim of abuse at home and you you can facilitate that happening by contributing 20p 50p a pound whatever anything and we're not spending money on the moment I know we don't have money at the moment no one has everyone's skinned so it's a it's a bigger commitment than usual but we're also not you know, buying three coffees a day and newspapers and magazines and going out for drinks after work. And we're not doing all those things either. So, you know, if, if everybody, if everybody gave a pound, you know what I mean? Like you'd very quickly have 10 grand in no time and help a lot of children. So thankfully people have been very generous. Great. Amazing. Well, thank you all so, so much. It's been lovely catching up with you all. Lovely. It's lovely to see you all. <laughs> I see you all back on the stage one day, very soon, hopefully. We'll be back. Yeah. We'll do something together. Yeah. This yeah. <laughs> well, if you need a first lady, let me know. Stay <laughs> 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 healthy, everyone. Yeah, you can look after yourselves and hopefully we'll see you all in real life soon. <laughs> Not Thank on a laptop. You. Everybody, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.